Welcome to the Healing Trauma Podcast. I'm so glad you're here. I'm Monique Coven. I'm the host. I'm a certified trauma recovery coach. I've worked for over 25 years as a social worker, and I'm a survivor. The Trauma Healing Podcast is for those who are healing trauma and finding ways to navigate through this messy, uncomfortable, and challenging recovery process. The intent of the podcast is to provide helpful information to validate, inspire you, support you on your healing recovery journey. You're going to hear stories from other survivors, trauma experts, and trauma therapists in the field that will provide information on effective trauma healing modalities, tools, techniques, skills, all in hopes of helping you heal. If you'd like to find out more information on trauma recovery healing, please go to my website at www.cptsdcoach.com. I also have an Instagram and Facebook page at cptsdcoach. If you have found this podcast helpful, one of the ways that you could support it is by leaving a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. Hi, everyone, and welcome back. So I'm really happy to share with you a conversation I had with Riley Scott, who is a singer-songwriter and also a survivor of developmental trauma. And I so appreciated uh, her conversation, her honesty and her vulnerability in talking about the journey of going through these symptoms that we have when we have been through trauma and the process of trying to access help from professionals and really not being supported due to a lack of understanding of essentially the professionals not being trauma-informed, not understanding the impact that trauma has on a person. And so um, she shares her, her story, which I'm sure many of you will be able to resonate with. And she talks about the journey that she's been on uh, with that and where she is right now um, and how she's doing. So I'm, I'm really happy to share this with you. I hope that you find it helpful and um, that it helps you uh, f- to feel validated and know that you're not alone in your experience. Hi, Riley. Hi, Monique. Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thank you so much. I love the giggle. <laughs> what's, the, what's the giggle about? It's, I'm just very, very excited because um, your podcast has been a really big part of my healing journey and also because this is quite a spontaneous conversation and so yes. I'm very excited. <laughs> yeah, so I'll just let the audience know. Um, so actually, I think we, we were kind of back and forth a little bit a long time ago, maybe when I first started and um, and then recently we were talking about you coming on the podcast and then we just had this conversation and it was so good. And I thought we should be recording this. This is so good for everyone to hear. And then we just said, okay, let's record right now. And that's what we're doing. (laughs) Yeah. It's so amazing. (laughs) Oh, it's great. And, and, you know, that's what we want. We want people to just feel like at home and connected and connected to your story and I, I sure was when you shared, it was mm. so relatable to mm. my story mm. and I know it's going to be to so many, so many people that are listening. So like, so maybe we could start with, um, like I asked you, I think I asked you the question about, um, like, did you know you had trauma? Well, maybe we'll just start right there. Yeah, totally. Um, no, I did not know that I had trauma. Um, so my story is a very, as most of us, ours, as most, as it is for most of us, is like a very long story mm-hmm. um, with 
many, many, many years of just not understanding what was going on with me and going to health professional after health professional to psychiatrist to social worker to mental health therapist to medical doctor to basically anyone that I thought could potentially support me and them just not understanding what was going on with me. So about 20 years ago now, I think, um, my parents had just separated and I was in university. Um, I was in my second year of university and I was having some um, OCD related symptoms. Like I just had very, very, very crippling anxiety. And so I went to my family doctor and of course um, she, they told me um, after about five minutes of talking, um, you have OCD. So I'm going to send you to the psychiatrist Um, so I went to the psychiatrist on campus and she brought me in and she sat me down and she explained and she said, um, so you have a serotonin imbalance in your brain and, um, in order to correct that, you have to take this medication and that's the solution. And you'll, you're just going to have to take this medication for the rest of your life. Like it's not your fault. Your brain just isn't producing sufficient neurotransmitters or chemicals and so that felt really shameful for me because at the time there was basically no conversation about mental health happening at all and I couldn't understand why I had such bad anxiety and I just thought there was something very very deeply wrong with me so I took the medication my anxiety was kind of always there but it would like come and go in terms of severity and it, but it was always there. And I didn't really find that the medication that I was taking really seemed to make much of a difference for me personally. So I just kind of lived the next, whatever, 15 or so years of my life thinking this. But it would, I would, these situations would happen where I would have what I now know are triggers. And I would become very dysregulated and I would go into a crisis state and um, but didn't understand that at the time and I would go to the doctor and they would just try to increase my medication I would get a different diagnosis I would somehow work my way through it and then just pick myself up off the off the floor and and just you know kind of get on with things and it wasn't until about five years ago now that um, through my work I'm I'm a singer songwriter, but I also work part time in social work for a community organization. And they sent me to a trauma informed yoga teacher training that I was interested in. And I read the manual for it and it was reference, you know, Peter Levine and Bessel van der Kolk and Judith Herman and all of these beautiful, beautiful, wonderful people. And of course, Richard Schwartz and the polyvagal theory. And I remember reading through this manual and I just thought, holy crap, like, this is me. Like, this is me, Mm -hmm. you know, but at the time I still didn't have much understanding and it it was really hard because I live in a really small town in Northern Canada and it's very, very not trauma informed. And so I had all of this information, but I had no idea really like what to do with it. Um, because I was going to the doctor and, and they, you know, just, you kind of get like blank stares and it's mm-hmm. just, <laughs> so it wasn't, an I know, the, I, I'm sorry, I'm laughing. Cause I, I know those stares no. and I'm sure a lot of people know them too. I know you do. And that's why I'm so grateful because honestly, like during that time, after I kind of started to wake up to what was going on with me, one of my only resources was the online community, such as like your podcast <laughs> an Instagram account because you're kind of being told it's almost like a form of like medical, well, I would call it almost like a form of gaslighting really, because, you know, you're having all these experiences and you're being told like, yeah, that your feelings aren't real. That's right. So it wasn't until about, um, I think it was probably about three or four years ago then that I started to have some pretty significant health issues, just really accum- like physical health issues, just really accumulate. And I was trying to figure that out all out. And then I discovered that I was experiencing two autoimmune illnesses, um, along with chronic fatigue and just chronic um, 
muscle tension and physical pain. And so that's when my journey really started to take off because mm-hmm. I was like, okay, I really have to figure out what's going on here. Like it's, it's really not good. And so that's mm-hmm. what's kind of led me down this path. But um, almost all of my resources have come from like online support such as yourself, because what ended up happening to me was um, I realized now was a form of long-term re-traumatization from like telling my story over and over and not um, being accumulated trauma symptoms basically. So my nervous system had become more dysregulated and I had more um, stress in my system just from not getting um, the right support really. So that's kind of, where I'm at now is working through a lot of that. <laughs> mm. Yeah. Oh my goodness. There's, there's so much to say in that. I, I feel you because uh, I was there too. And it's, it's very painful. And yes, it is re-traumatizing um, because you are living with PTSD symptoms. Um, you're not understanding them and you're going and you're trying to explain with words what you're feeling, what's happening, and they're not hearing you. They're not, they're looking at you, like we said, blank stares, um, or they're giving you, like you said, you know, take these pills. And again, I have nothing against medication. They're very, they can be very helpful, Um, you know, or, uh, you know, just throwing different diagnosis on you. And the mean, in the meanwhile, you're getting re-traumatized because that's what happened when you were younger, you were trying to reach for help or you needed help. And it's just like, there was no help. So that's really, really painful. And I think a part of uh, a little bit of the healing, I think I was telling you this before is sharing now your story and what happened. Um, even with the, I'm talking about mm-hmm. the people not even understanding yeah. you, even that piece and, and sharing that. Um, I've had, I've had in my own mind, I've had, um, and I very well may do this. I'm still thinking about it, but I, I see myself going back to the hospital mm-hmm. that I went to for 15 years, calling all of the doctors mm-hmm. around and saying, please sit down. <laughs> We're yes. having a meeting yes. and I'm, and I'm going to teach you a couple of things. Although, you know, I'm thinking today they, you know, I'm hoping and praying that they're more trauma informed, but I think, you know, just yeah. to kind of come back to that place. You know, Riley, I, 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 I think that this piece, this part of what happened is also a part of our trauma story or our trauma experience. I know when I have shared, I will often include how, uh, how it was for me, um, trying to access the right kind of support, the right kind of help. You know, when I first, um, I shared this in a previous podcast, but, um, this was when I was experiencing PTSD symptoms and I remember sharing it with a friend and she told me about, um, that there was such a thing as, um, medication that could help you with those symptoms um she labeled it anxiety and that's what it felt like to me Uh, that was the closest thing anyway uh, that i could grab onto and i thought oh my goodness there's such a thing as a pill that you can take (laughs) this was really at the beginning of my of my healing journey and i thought oh that's the most incredible thing and she said sort of the same thing that um there's, you know, you, you have a lack of serotonin. And so I just, I ran to um, a clinic, met with a doctor. She right away prescribed me um, some anti-anxiety medication. I took it and I had some questions and I had some symptoms. And that's when I thought, well, you know what? Um, I'm going to see a specialist in anxiety. Uh, And who is that? A psychiatrist. And I also had a lot of shame around the idea of seeing a psychiatrist, a lot of shame, because in my mind, I associated with that means crazy, that means you're unwell. So I walked in there almost wishing like a turtle, you know, like, hope nobody sees me, Um, met this this psychiatrist. And um, I remember her looking at me and I was explaining what I was experiencing. And she said that I had generalized anxiety and she had me do a, a formal test that was the results. Of course, they don't test or ask on the test about any PTSD symptoms because that's not in their radar. 
but um, I saw her because I wanted to understand um, what was happening with me and some guidance with the medication and and basically the whole 15 years of seeing her was really her trying to help me with my anxiety the best way she knew how which was changing different medications that really weren't doing much in terms of my anxiety it helped a little bit um, but I figured a little bit is better than nothing. But during those 15 years, she kept pushing um, CBT. And I would try it. And as I've mentioned in this podcast before, I tried over 15 different therapists. A lot of them CBT, thoughts-based, cognitive-based. And when I would come back and say it wasn't helpful, she'd give me that, you know, the look we're talking about. And I think that's because they did not understand that for trauma survivors, when we are dysregulated, the prefrontal cortex, the thinking brain that allows you to do the skills that they're telling you to do, is offline. The thinking brain is not working. That is why it's not that it's not working, but it's offline. We don't have the capacity to follow through on those on those things that require the logical brain. And that's why it wasn't working. It had nothing to do with us. So that whole 15-year experience was very, very, very traumatizing because every time I would see her and explain, it's not getting better. I've tried this. I've tried that. I've tried this. It was like, you're not trying hard enough something's wrong with you. I finally stopped seeing her. But I totally relate, Riley, to that experience of the re-traumatization that you're talking about. And I think many listeners understand that as well. I really do. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing that. And I think um, that's one of the reasons that I connected with your podcast so much was that what you were sharing was so similar to my own story. Um, Like so strikingly so that hearing you share those things felt incredibly, like I was so sad to hear that you had gone through that, but it was so incredibly validating for me. And also in a lot of ways empowering because I was seeing where you are now and how far you've come. And so that was, one of the things on my journey, like using resources like yours as support into your podcast was, um, yeah, part of the, part of the piece of what encouraged me to keep going, um, despite what I was being told by the mainstream medical system, basically. Um, so it was just so hugely helpful. And I, I also want to share that, um, The piece going back about what I was told by the psychiatrist when I was in university about the whole like chemical imbalance piece and taking medication. Like, I don't think if medication is something that is helpful, I think it can be used as one of the tools definitely that can support people. But in my case, the issue with that was that it was not the complete picture. And so only hearing that one specific part that left out basically everything that was under the iceberg kind of left me in this position of not actually recovering because I was like, okay, it's just a chemical imbalance. I just need to take this medication. Mm -hmm. Well, no, because that actually having that belief actually prevented me from doing the actual work and, and finding out what was actually going on until I just got so unwell and had so many crisis situations that I had to look deeper because I was like, there is something more going on here. Like it's not, this is not helping, you know? Yeah, totally. Yeah. And um, I, I mean, I felt a little bit of a relief at first. I don't know if you did when it was like, oh, I just have to just take this pill and it'll fix everything. Um, but I didn't even know what everything was. I just knew how I felt. Um, yeah, so I agree with you. I think, you know, it can be part of it, but definitely not alone. Uh, yeah, I mean, I definitely, I have to be honest. I think for me, one of the biggest things, like pieces of my healing journey has been really honoring that like voice deep down inside of me that tells me things that I know are truth because that voice was really silenced for a long time 
both in my trauma and then afterwards and the help that I tried to seek, that voice was silenced. And so that's part of the re-traumatization. But I do remember really clearly when I was told that by the psychiatrist, like something deep inside of me was like, that doesn't seem right. Like (laughs) that inherently does not seem right. But I just ignored it because I was like, well, this is a doctor telling me this. This is like the top of the food chain. So like clearly those feelings are wrong. So I think what happened was like, initially maybe there was a bit of relief honestly I think there was more like embarrassment and shame because again it was that feeling of like there's something wrong with me because my brain for some reason isn't producing enough serotonin or whatever but then what ended up happening actually was more despair because the tools that they were giving me that I was told were supposed to be the magic solution weren't working. So then it was Mm -hmm. a deeper sense of like, okay, clearly this is my fault. Like you shared with the CBT Mm, and all, you know? So I think, yeah. uh, yeah. So I think it didn't really give me a sense of relief because it wasn't actually like I sense that it wasn't the answer, but I was being told that it was, if that makes any sense. Oh, I, I totally resonate that I, because that was exactly my experience. And uh, I think you mentioned yours was also 15 years of this. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's that, I mean, at that time, I never would have questioned uh, in my mind, if they have a PhD yeah. in psychiatry or psychology, yeah. they're, they know the answers. Yeah. And I was like, you know, um, but uh, yeah, I just, I, I, and I think with our trauma history of, you know, there's issues of, of, of feeling like, okay, with authority, feeling yeah. some, uh, if you're speaking up and all those things, naturally we, you know, it, it yes, the experience really is can be re-traumatizing. Um, mm-hmm. So I just want to say, like, I really want to, I want to validate your experience and uh, for what you went through and, and say that I'm, you know, I'm really sorry that, that you had to go through that. And thanks. Monique. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think um, that's one of the reasons that I'm so grateful for this because it's kind of like you said earlier, like for this conversation, because every time I do this, it's, healing for me and then also my hope is to bring validation to other people that are going through it because I just don't want anyone else to go through that even though I know people are every day yeah yeah I get I get messages a lot from people and even some of the clients I work with they're like I didn't know I had I just thought I had anxiety or yes you know and and so it's uh yeah. yeah so you are doing that for sure I think what what would be a great, um, great thing for us to talk about now is where you are in terms of therapy. Like, have you found uh, trauma trained help? Yeah. Yeah. So I think honestly that that, like, I look back now and I feel so lucky because I think it was, it was purely through listening to my intuition that I found this current therapist who is trauma informed But frankly, like I've been working with him for three years now and he's absolutely incredible. But like at the beginning of my therapeutic journey with him, I was so confused by what he was doing because I had never experienced therapy like that before. And I think I still didn't understand for fully that I had been traumatized. And so my system was incredibly shut down. Like that was part of it for me is living in a state of, um, like chronic dissociation. And I was so dissociated that it took about three years of working with him. But I also have to, like before I started opening up, but I also have to look at that and understand the years. Like you said, for me, it was actually like 17, 18 years of re-traumatization after re-traumatization after re-traumatization within the system. So I have to look at that and be like, well, it makes sense that it took me three years to trust him because I knew I needed help, but I went in there just having no trust that he knew what he was doing. Um, And so I'm just extremely lucky. Yeah, like he is totally trauma informed and like focuses on. So the difference is that in his practice, he focuses on attachment 
which is huge. That's one of the first things he said to me was, I want you to look up attachment. And at the time I was like, what the heck is this guy talking about? And and (laughs) now I'm clearly obsessed with attachment theory and the nervous system. Um, He's constantly bringing me back to my body. So he incorporates a lot of somatic based practices and that was scary because I remember the first time he asked me like what's going on inside and I always say it honestly it was like I don't know if I've been asked a question that could have been more disturbing to me just because it was like he could have been speaking Japanese to me like I, I was so disconnected from my internal experience that I just didn't even understand what that question meant which says a lot um about like where I've come now yeah um but yeah no it's um I'm very lucky and he does work within the healthcare system so I'm I just I feel like I've won the lottery honestly (laughs) ah so I can hear I hear I can hear the gratefulness that you have (laughs) and I'm I'm so I'm so happy that you have that that it makes it makes all the difference doesn't it it does I think I also want to add which I think is very important is that He's always approached our time together and what I experience in terms of um, like quote unquote symptoms or whatever you want to call it as making so much sense based on what I've been through and like constantly reiterating how I'm not broken and it's constantly putting me into a position of empowerment rather than disempowerment Mm -hmm. Um, and recognizing Mm -hmm. the inherent intelligence of my system And so for Mm -hmm. me, that's been the main difference between trauma-informed therapy versus like therapy that isn't trauma-informed. And that's been the huge, the huge shift for me. Oh, that just, (laughs) that's so (laughs) wonderful. I'm so glad. So maybe you can just share with us a little bit of, um, so I was going to say some of the changes that you've noticed within yourself. You mentioned, first of all, starting to be able to become more embodied or more present. I know that's huge for trauma survivors. Like you said, we're so used to um, being disconnected. I always say it's like we are ahead with legs. Yeah. Um, (laughs) yeah so yeah maybe you can share a little bit of what you've noticed what else you've noticed yeah so it's definitely been really slow and I'm definitely still at like the very beginning of my process I would say even though I already feel like I've come so far um but it's it's small things like being able to even like recognize what recognize what a nervous system state I'm in and then do Mm -hmm. Um, different regulating actions to to bring me you know into my window of tolerance so that's a huge one Um, I would say also one of the hugest things for me has been his validation of my body processing so I used to think that there was something wrong if I cried or um, you know I used to try to shut that down and he's really validated no like you like that's good you need to do that because that's your body processing and he's he's always told me you know um what does he say crying shaking sweating uh yelling Mm -hmm. um and then what's the last one the ways that our body moves and processes traumatic energy and one of the most fascinating things that's happened to me over the past year um has been a great deal of body tremoring. Um, Like my body will just kind of go into spontaneous shaking. And at first it was kind of, it it can feel scary because you kind of think like, is there something wrong? Um, But I, you know, I did go to my doctor and make sure everything was okay. And it, it is, it's just, we've kind of discovered that it's, it's probably my nervous system releasing traumatic stress, which is kind of, mind-blowing because what I've learned about that is that my system and you know as we know it's not a cognitive thing it's not my brain deciding okay I'm going to release now it's my body is finally in a in a in a space where it feels safe enough for that process to naturally occur which is like so mind-blowing when you think about it like the intelligence of our systems you know yes absolutely Yeah. So, so would that just happen? Was that happening with your, 
while you're working with him in session or was that just happening you're walking down the street <laughs> or you're in your home yeah um <laughs> so yeah so it does happen in session with him if we're reviewing mm-hmm. material um like old material it will happen i'll notice it happening but it also started happening uh actually spontaneously during the night when i was asleep and it would wake me up and it felt alarming at first and thankfully I live with my best friend and she's really supportive. So I would, you know, if I needed to, I would wake her up and she would just sit with me. But, Mm -hmm. um, it was, it was, um, it did feel frightening at first, at first for sure. But that's why I'm so grateful to have the knowledge that I do because Mm -hmm. I, I think that's so empowering too, you know, to understand like, my body is naturally going through this process. Like it's just completely mind blowing to me. Mm. (laughs) Wow. It sounds from our discussion that you just, um, it sounds like you have um, trust in your body. Yeah. Starting to, starting to. I mean, I I think it's important for people to know that it's not black and white, you know, like I still have some practices. Like one of the things that I have been doing for a long time, which is hard to kind of, break is um like I'll control my eating if I'm if I'm sensing there's there's um like sensation or emotion in my body that feels too overwhelming um I will restrict my eating and I I it took me a long time to realize that that was like you know even though it's not good for me in the long time in the long term sorry that's that was a regulating tool that I used when I didn't know Mm -hmm. what Mm -hmm. else to do and so I think it's important. I want people to know it's not black and white. Like I do still struggle with that. It's something I'm working on, but I at least have a better understanding of why I'm doing it and that, you know, there's other things that I can slowly replace that with. Yeah. I love the word slowly. Yeah. Yeah, We talked about that because I don't want, um, anybody to be under the misconception that it's fast. It's just, it's not. And, and that's okay. Yeah. Oh, well, this was a wonderful conversation. Um, is there anything you want to say before we close? <sighs> Frankly, I could just keep talking to you about this all day, but I know <laughs> we can't do that. But um, yeah. I think I just want to say <laughs> how grateful I am to people like you that have openly shared their stories because I still feel it's really scary still to openly share mine because I don't. I don't want to be stigmatized, but if Mm -hmm. it wasn't for people like you, I wouldn't be where I'm at now because I had to look outside of the system, you know, and Mm -hmm. I want to be part of that movement as well. Um, And so, because I think there is, I just feel so strongly in my body that like there is a, there's going to have to be a paradigm shift that is happening especially Mm -hmm. right now with everything that's going on in the world, like we are going to have to change Mm -hmm. the way that we look at mental health because I mean, this is a generalization, but I just think that the way it's been going, like it's just not working on like a larger scale. Mm -hmm. So um, I hope that that starts to happen. Yeah. Yeah. And if people want to get in touch with you, how can they um, find you, your Instagram account, uh, yeah, other ways? Um, yeah. So my Instagram account is um, Riley Scott Music, and uh, the spelling of my first name is R E I L L Y, um, and then Scott with two T's. And so there, or on Facebook, it's the same. Um, and my email is Riley Scott Music at gmail dot com. And just um, I also, if you're interested, um, the majority of my music is written. Um, about my healing journey and um you can listen to my music um you can stream it on spotify or google play or on Bandcamp. well thanks riley for sharing and really being vulnerable with your experience and um i'm sure that it's appreciated by uh by the listeners i know i appreciated it if you're interested in finding out how to work with me there are two ways the first is through a short-term trauma program called An Introduction to Understanding Your Nervous System from a Polyvagal Lens. This is a five-week, one-to-one online program 
where you're going to learn all about how your nervous system works. You're going to learn about why it responds the way that it does and how to begin to show your body how to come back to regulation to feel safer, how to become more embodied and present. These five weekly individual sessions are going to help you track your responses and triggers and regulate your nervous system. Another way, which is what I call a deeper dive, is a 12-week trauma healing program. And here, you're going to also learn all about your nervous system. But in addition to that, you're also going to learn about other things related to trauma and healing, such as understanding attachment, inner child parts work, boundaries, and so much more. To find out more about my trauma recovery coaching options, you can visit my website at www.cbtsdcoach.com. 